Well, hello there. My name is Roy Cohen, and I'll be hosting this week's edition of the Community Forum Show, a show of uh, weekly interest that we hope you were able to enjoy on an ongoing basis. And today, if we're going to be talking about money, money management. We're talking about asset, um, asset management, and uh, I think you'll enjoy the conversation because we're going to be touching on a whole lot of different subjects with a person who's got the expertise extraordinaire. And at that point, I'd like to introduce Frank Crimmins. Welcome to the show, Frank. Thank you, Roy. It's pleasure a pleasure. To be. It's a pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. It's, uh, our relationship goes back many, many years yeah. to the days of uh, serving on the Board of Selectmen together. That's right. When you used to drive me, the chairman, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but we got things done, and it was a pleasure at that particular time. Frank, I, I was checking over your resume, and, and uh, without, without spending um, the next half hour talking about all the things that you've done, can you briefly give us a little history of uh, your beginnings here in Stoughton, uh, the family, or whatever you want to tell everybody so they can learn about you? Sure. Thank you, Roy. Pleasure to be here. i am uh, grown up in the town, been here all my life. My father had a family business, real estate and insurance. So all my brothers and sisters and I worked in that business at certain times. If my father were in something else, we'd probably have gone into those other things. But we all, uh, we went into, uh, at some point, to help out at the office. And we worked in either real estate or insurance or both. I did some of both. I... Uh, Went to college. After college, I wanted to be a lawyer, so I worked at a real, as a real estate and insurance broker. Went to law school nights. I got a law degree, and I opened a practice in Stoughton, and I did uh, the general practice of law from 1981 to 1992 in Stoughton. And uh, I enjoyed that very much. I got an opportunity and a great privilege of being appointed by then Governor William Weld as a judge in the district court. I served as a district court judge from 1992 to 2010. I left the bench in 2010 uh, to, uh, I was getting ready to go back into private practice. I, Took a little detour as the Stoughton Town Manager for a couple of years. I left that, went back into private practice. A, uh, a similar opportunity to Stoughton opened up in Avon in 2014. The board over there, Board of Selectmen, thought I had a good background to help them out with some things they needed done over there. And I, I served in that capacity as well as practicing law from 2014 to uh, just recently. I, I just left the town of Avon February of uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. They were great to me. I can't say enough good things about them. They were great. I could have stayed, but I wanted to go back to practice and do that exclusively. And so I'm still uh, practicing law at the same spot uh, in Stoughton on Washington Street, right in front of Amelia's restaurant, that mm -hmm. strip mall there. And that's what I do and have some people that work with me in the office and we are engaged in the uh, law practice of, we have a elder law and a state planning practice there. Just for curiosity, to go back to the, to the point of being a, appointed a judge, yeah. normally a person takes an appointment like that and does it for life. But well, you decided along the way to give it up. Well, it's considered a lifetime appointment because you can serve until age 70. And there's one school of thought back in the day that people would retire at 70 and get out. But to tell you the truth, um, I served as a judge for 17 and a half years, which is actually two and a half years longer than most judges serve. Mm -hmm. Most judges are older when they get appointed. I was young uh, when I was appointed, so even though I, I got out as uh, 
I like to think I got out as a young guy. Um, I, I was young as a judge. So I, I put 17 and a half years in, and actually that's a little longer than most. A lot but, of but, pressure. Um, interesting job. It's a wonderful job. Someday it's, you'll have to write a book about it. The, uh, I don't think so, nope. but, uh, <laughs> but, it, it, but it, it's a, it's a great, it's a great uh, profession, it's a great privilege. If, if you're a lawyer and you like public service like you do, it's a, it's a natural thing to go into that if you get the opportunity. And you work with great people, you see a slice of humanity. District Court is the court where most cases go. I had the privilege of working with uh, just great people over the years, mm -hmm. and uh, that that part I miss seeing the people I worked with. But it was uh, it was time to do other things, and like I said, I did it for a good amount of time. Yeah, good for you. Yep. So now you're concentrating on elder law and estate planning. Yep. Uh, can we get a little resume of what that's all about? I mean, everybody uh, out there, I'm sure, unless they have an unending supply of uh, cash. Uh, to last them the rest of their lives. I'm sure that uh, there's a time when you have to start thinking about managing your money. Yeah. And that's where you come in? Well, I'd say with respect to the profession, it's a, it's a growing area because you and I are part of the baby boomer generation, which right. is no news flash to you. And we are in the biggest demographic cohort that the country's ever seen. And people live longer today. When, when you and I were young boys, you would have heard people talk about, well, you work till you're 65 because they picked up on that year because that was the year people maxed out with their ability to get a social security benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, when social security started, uh, you could retire with a full benefit at 65 but the life expectancy was 68. So it, it wasn't designed to be something that would uh, take care of you for a long duration. Now for a statistical average to be 68, obviously there were people a lot longer, older than 68, mm -hmm. just like there are people that don't make it to 68, but uh, it's different today. People live longer. A baby born today in a Boston area hospital has a life expectancy just shy of 85 years. Really? And people live a long time today. So for that statistical average to be there, and the life insurance companies with the actuarial uh, information give us these vital statistics. But for that to happen, that means every time you hear about uh, some tragedy with a 20-something in an automobile or whatever, you know, there's some senior living well into their dotage a lot longer than 85. And we all know that to be true just from our own experiences mm -hmm. and people live a long time. So what's the point? If as a young person, you worked your whole life thinking, you'll work till 65. And then there's only a certain amount of years that you'll be needing income. That sort of has gone upside down with Advances in medicine, just people's health, the area of the country we live in, the just great fortune we have to live in this country and live near these medical centers and people need to have their money last a long time. So where does that go? It goes back to the area I'm in. So there are people, which is no newsflash to you, that are our age, younger than our age, taking care of a mother, a father, an aunt, uncle, other extended family members. They might be taking care of kids and grandkids. They might not only have that, might not only be the uh, sandwich generation, it might be a club sandwich, mm -hmm. it might be a, an extra big club sandwich, depending on how many you, you take care of. And there's a need for that. The cost of health care is huge. And we fit in by assisting people with some of the legal consequences of those demographics of living longer and having some people um, live a long time. So what is elder law? If I were to give you a real quick version of it, the elder law part of 
estate planning and elder law would be the legal equivalent of uh, the emergency room type of practice where somebody gets a call that a loved one is on their way to an acute care hospital after suffering a stroke or some sort of a trauma, uh, the heart attack that gets them to a hospital. And after uh, a very short amount of time in the hospital, the way hospital regulations are, they're moving you from the acute care bed into some sort of a rehab. Mm -hmm. And people 65 years of age or over will have, for the most part, most will qualify for Medicare, and Medicare will pay for the rehab. But once you've finished your rehab, somebody at the rehab unit will be talking to you about going home. And some people aren't set up to be able to navigate and contract for their own safety at home, and they may need assistance. But if they've reached their plateau of their medical rehabilitation, uh, they can't just stay in the place they've been at without paying at a different rate. Medicare will only pay for 100 days of what's referred to as custodial care. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's private pay. So if you don't have a plan for that, and all of a sudden you're faced with somebody giving you a contract, and the contract says, at this particular skilled nursing facility, we'll admit you but the going rate is $488 a day for a private room, that can get your attention pretty quickly. I'd imagine so. And when you figure what that is per month, that's about 15,000, just shy of that per month. When you annualize that, that's 180,000 per day. And the insurance companies that write long-term care policies tell us that the average length of stay for a woman in a skilled nursing facility is four years. Their male counterpart, it's three years. So you're talking about managing a risk of uh, either 180,000 times four, 720,000, 180,000 times three, 540,000. It's a lot of money. And so that's the elder law piece. Okay. And, and so then the estate planning piece is more uh, deliberative. The estate planning piece is when people do not have a medical emergency putting a uh, gun to their head uh, as far as having to make a big decision. They're, they're healthy, they come up with a plan for uh, who would be in charge if they cannot uh, take care of themselves, how their assets will get managed if they cannot do that, and ultimately what will happen if, after they pass on, those type of things. That's the estate planning piece. Mm -hmm. So there's two different types of things. So the, uh, the basics, Roy, of an estate plan in this type of area involves certain documents on the health side of things and certain documents on the financial side of things. And we could talk about those later, but that's, that's where the role of the lawyer comes in. So we try to assist people with the type of documents they will need if certain exigencies ever happen down the road, because you have to plan for it now mm -hmm. while you can, because if you wait, you may not be able to make the documents because you have to be competent to make your documents. So it's the same argument. You're, uh, you know, uh, if you have a friend, uh, I'm sure you know, you know a ton of people. You must have somebody who calls you about like life insurance, and they'll say, uh, "Hey, we've, I got to talk to you about a policy," and and you have to get it when you can because if you need it down the road, More you, you may find out. Right, you might not be insurable because of medical conditions or the ex 
uh, expense, like you say, may bar you from getting the type of policy to help you out that way. So, or your age. Right, right, uh, because premiums are, will be based on that. So it's, it's real interesting. It's very sp fact specific, but it's not for, but here's the point. It's not for old people. It's not for old people. It's, it includes old people, but we don't just deal with you know, a senior population. We, we have people that at any age uh, need some assistance. I mean, when a parent uh, looking on with pride sees their young son or daughter graduate from high school and uh, the young man or woman is going to upstate New York to go to college for a few years, that young adult needs to have certain paperwork because they need a health care proxy. Mm -hmm. They need to have an agent designated to assist if uh, they need some assistance with some medical decisions. So it's, a, it's an interesting field. I work with great people. You get a chance to help people. And our number one goal is to assist people with the peace of mind of knowing that if something happens, that they will be prepared to deal with that. And it won't replace the fact that they're dealing with the situation, but they will have the peace of mind of knowing that they have carved out a plan to assist them if, if they need it in the future. So it's, it's very satisfying work. It sounds it's very involved no. also. No. And, and, uh, but if, if a person um, is in the nursing home and they come out and they're all of a sudden faced with the $15,000 a month bill and they don't have that money, what happens? That's, that's a great question. First of all, the, the first question is, how do you get in what you refer to as the nursing home? Or right. We refer to as the skilled nursing facility, a SNF, skilled nursing facility, because the type of housing uh, affects cost and regulations and whatever. So there is senior housing, mm -hmm. there's public senior housing, there's private senior housing, there's uh, senior communities that have restrictions on who can live there, there's congregate housing, there's assisted living facilities, and there are skilled nursing facilities. And then you can also turn your own home into your own private skilled nursing facility. But to answer your question, how do you do it? You have to, have to be admitted. And to be admitted, someone wants you to sign a contract. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, are you able to sign your own contract? Uh, are you competent to sign a contract? And do you have the capacity to do that? So assuming you are, you sign a contract, and in that contract, there is a difference between different skilled nursing facilities. And they, they cost different amounts of money. And I could take you if, uh, to a group of 10, and you would, after touring the 10, you will see the differences, stark differences, from one to 10. In what, the type of facility? Type of facilities, the, care? Yep, the, the amount of staff, uh, the amenities, uh, everything that goes along with that type of thing. And if you uh, uh, are ever in that situation, matter of fact, it's, it's not a bad idea to, uh, maybe someday I'll, I'll take you on a tour of some of them. You'll, you'll see the difference yourself. And on some of these you'll say, would I want my mother to be in that facility? And on some you wouldn't. And on others, they're very, very good and they have very, very uh, good people that care for their population and whatever, who are not always seniors, by the way, because mm -hmm. uh, the medical needs can affect people at, at different times, that type of thing. But that costs money. And if you, and there's basically three ways people have traditionally paid for their room and board in a skilled nursing facility. And I'm not talking about assisted living, but skilled nursing facility where you get uh, licensed people to administer medicines and doctors and nurses come for your care. But either one, it's private pay. Someone gets a bill each month, you write out a check and you pay it. And if you have enough to do it, 
That's how somebody pays for that. Second way that some people are able to do, but not that many, if somebody had the benefit of foresight in the disposable income to get a long-term care policy, and they have a long-term care policy, and if they have a long-term care policy that pays enough, because the policies the people got before uh, a lot will not take care of the price of the room today, but it gives you a good head start if you had it. What am I talking about? If you had a policy that paid a maximum of 350 a day and you're in a place that charges 500 a day, that's not bad to have 350 of the 500 paid uh, out of the policy mm -hmm. because you only have to come up with the difference of 150. So some people have a long-term care policy and that policy and the proceeds of that will be used to pay for most of their care. And if you don't have private pay or if your money runs out and if you don't have a long-term care policy, the third way uh, is public pay and that will be Mass Health. Mm -hmm. And Mass Health is the name we give to the Medicaid program in this state, which is a federal program. It's a federal state partnership. is It's administered all over the country. And in Massachusetts, we refer to it as Mass Health. And to get on Mass Health, it's a needs-based program. Mm -hmm. And the public policy behind that, as you know, is that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will pay for an applicant's medical care once they have exhausted their own ability to pay for that care. But when they say exhaust your ability, they mean exhaust and you have to have very few assets that you control to become eligible for that. So. Uh, a single person cannot have more than $2,000 of countable assets to qualify for mass health long-term care planning for seniors, as opposed to other types of mass health. It's not very much. It's not very much. And a married applicant cannot have more than $3,000 of countable assets and so that gets in the question of what's a countable asset versus non-countable and things like that. But that is the third way. So to answer your question, how do you pay for that care? Option one, private pay, if you can. Mm -hmm. Option two, long-term care policy, if you have one. Option three, public pay. And so assisting people with those type of things in planning for those options or managing the risk that people have is part of what we do, and it's a very satisfying part of the practice. Mm. Now, if age alone is a determinant of whether or not somebody is likely to have the need for a skilled nursing facility, but if somebody has had a tough hand dealt with them with a medical presentation, and they have a family history on top of that that allows them to make an inference that uh, they may be dealing with a, a chronic health care issue that will cost a lot of money to manage. Uh, they can prepare for that now in advance of the problem and to make sure there are assets put aside for that exigency and try to protect them from the reach of other creditors and things like that. So that's all part of that process. So it's very fact spe uh, specific, you know, and it's interesting. Oh, it certainly sounds it. Yeah. In any event, uh, the nursing home or the facility that's taking care of you will get paid one way or another from any of those sources that you're talking about. Or, or you, you're not at that place. So it, it's not like some people say, I don't want the nursing home to get my money. Well, again, we talk about skilled nursing facilities and uh, it costs a lot for them to run. Um, 
They cost a lot to operate because of the high payroll costs that they have sure. and the regulations they have to deal with. And it's 24 seven. But to, uh, to get that type of care, that costs money and uh, people, have to, people have to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, hopefully you do these type of documents and you never have to use them. I'm sure at your house you have a, a homeowner's policy and unless you had ice dam damage because of a storm in the winter or with one of those storms that knocked down trees and things like that, most people haven't had a chance to or need to read their homeowner's policy for years. But they know where it is in case they have it. So if they go down the Cape for a weekend and they come back and a storm hit and trees knocked into their roof and caused water damage and all this, they know they have that plan tucked away in that drawer over there with their safe keep keeping documents. You know, with uh, that kind of incident covered. Right, and same with this type of thing. Right. We, we try to assist people with those type of plans and it's obviously a lot easier to have this conversation with people when they don't have a crisis on their hands. Oh yeah, plan ahead. Yeah. The old Boy Scout rule. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, you, you have a, um, I would think that it would be the Frank uh, Crimmins Insurance Agency, but it's not. It's a, it's a, Ab, init, init, let me get the word, initio. Ab initio. Yep. Ab initio. Yep. Yep. What, what is the meaning of that? Uh, that's an unusual name. It is unusual. It's a great question. It's not something that a marketing person would suggest because it's not a retail name because people haven't heard about it and people don't pronounce it because they've never heard of it. It's a Latin word, it means from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the most people I think that have heard ab initio lately are people that followed the Aaron Hernandez trial and he died in prison mm -hmm. while his uh, conviction was being appealed, and you heard yes. that expression, the conviction was void ab initio. I didn't hear and, that. And they were changing the law over that because the conviction gets wiped out because before his appeal was settled, uh, he died. Right. And so it was void ab initio, so it, it didn't exist. But ab initio is a legal term from a Latin root, ab initio, from the beginning, it's a word that lawyers know. Mm -hmm. So I picked that because it's a legal term and it connotes to lawyers that I'm in this niche type of practice dealing with elder law things that I'm not looking to get clients for other type of things. I anticipated and it turned out that I get referrals from lawyers and a lot of lawyers that have very interesting practices that cover a whole wide area of different fields of law will have people in the categories we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And they know if uh, they send over a client to me that uh, we will take care of the client's needs and we won't uh, take their client. We send them back for all the uh, other things, that type of thing, and, but we help them out. So it's a uh, ab initio from the beginning. So why did we pick it? In, a, in addition to that word that would mean something to lawyers, the, I guess the marketing part is send us the problem when it's small right at the beginning before it, begets, it goes too far down the road, turns out to be a big problem, takes a lot of time and therefore a lot of money. Right. Let, let's keep it small, manage it small, nip it in the bud small before it gets out of hand. And so that, that's the idea of it. So that's the idea of that, uh, that name. Interesting. Yeah. Um, do you need a will? Do, do people need wills? Uh, should yes. everybody have one? Yeah, yeah, they, they do. And a lot of people like off the street will come in and say, hey, I think I need a will because uh, 
getting to be that stage of my life and we're taking a trip and we have kids and that type of thing. And that, that's one of the basic documents in the state plan, but it's the most important document someone has to have is a healthcare proxy because there's a greater chance somebody will get in a car accident or some type of accident and need somebody that way. Mm -hmm. So the, the basics of an uh, estate plan, three basic documents on, a, uh, on the health side. Uh, the picture, picture, you know, I, I tell people when they come in, picture your, your legal house. Your house as it applies to legal things. It's like a two family. There's a health side of the house, there's a financial side of the house. And on the health side, you should have a health care proxy. Uh, we discuss a living will with people that have a health care proxy. And then we uh, encourage people to have a HIPAA waiver in authorization. Those are the three basic documents. So just quickly on that, uh, if you're knocked out in the car and you lose consciousness, and somebody has to make a decision as to some elective procedure to perform on you. You need somebody that can make that decision if you are not able to do that. Is that the health care proxy? Yes, where you designate an agent. Okay. But you have to do that before it happens because obviously in that hypothetical, right. you, you can't do that. Right. So, and that will only go in effect under the statute if your treating physician makes a determination that you're either incapable or not competent, lack the capacity to make your own decisions, and your treating physician puts that in writing. So sometimes somebody will have a health care proxy and say, I am my mother's health care agent right. under this proxy. Well, where's your mother? Well, she's at home. And I want to talk to you about it. Well, it's not in effect yet. If the treating physician didn't right. put that in writing and invoke the, the provisions of it, it, it's not in effect. So healthcare proxy, that's important. And people 18 years of age need one of those. A living will requires a little explanation. I'm still long-winded like I was before. You're but, doing fine, Frank. But the, uh, because we don't have a living will statute in Massachusetts. We're one of three states that do not have a living will. But a living will works with the healthcare proxy to let your agent know your thoughts about certain end of life situations and certain scenarios. And a lot of this happened to do with a case right out of Stoughton where there was a hospital in Stoughton where there was a particular gentleman uh, who was a firefighter named Peter Brophy and it was Brophy versus, uh, on this particular case, uh, New England Sinai. That case became law because uh, the gentleman unfortunately had an aneurysm mm -hmm. and the loss of blood after that aneurysm in his brain put him in a vegetative state Whoa. and he didn't need anything else to help him breathe, but he was never gonna recover from that vegetative state and his wife wanted to take him off this feeding tube that they had in. The hospital didn't know what to do. They asked the court what should they do. And as a result of that, we, uh, we have a case about substituted judgment and all that. So without getting too far afield, most states, 47 states, have a living will statute. Now, you follow the political scene. The last time this issue was on the ballot in Massachusetts was 2010 on a statewide referendum. And the people that were advocates for this particular bill referred to it as a right to die or death with dignity statute. The people uh, that opposed the living will legislation uh, referred to it as physician assisted suicide, mm -hmm. Dr. Kevorkian type of right. legislation. That's allowed in some states out west, I believe, isn't it? 47 states. 47 states. 47 states. But so we don't have living wills, but people in estate planning still use the document because of the aspirational language, because it, it forces the person you 
pick as an agent to uh, have a discussion with you about certain right to die things. And that discussion is important because there's a difference between a healthcare proxy and a living will. In a healthcare proxy, you have a patient over there who cannot make a decision from themselves because they may be under a induced coma uh, for pain management mm -hmm. and to let their body recover in a restive state and they picked you to be their agent. And you're speaking, saying what that person would have wanted if they were able to speak for themselves. Under a, contrast that with the living will. With the living will, that patient is saying what they would want mm -hmm. in their own words in that document. Right. So those two documents, healthcare proxy, one, Living will, two, and then a thing called the HIPAA waiver. Now, when you go to the doctor, you probably hear someone in the office say, Sign here. Same information, you live the same place, same insurance, those type of things. We get, need you to sign HIPAA. Right. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Patient Accountability Act, H-I-P-A-A. It's only been around since 1996. Mm -hmm. It's a federal statute. But it recognizes the fact that we are in a computer age and for a doctor over there to get paid for the office visit with you today, information about you is going to be sent over there to CMS that runs Medicare, or if you have supplemental insurance, it's gonna go to your Blue Cross, Harvard Pilgrim, Tufts carrier over here. Information about you that's confidential is going to go to those type of places. That's and if you sign the form? If you sign, because you hold the privilege, because there are certain relationships in society that are deemed to be so important that they have special uh, obligations, responsibilities, and protections. And one of those is the patient-physician privilege, and the patient holds the privilege. So if you went to a doctor and you were concerned that you may have some sort of growth and you're concerned, might it be cancerous or whatever, uh, you might not want the rest of the world knowing that. And no one's supposed to know it, now, unless you decide to tell them. But the doctor's office isn't supposed to tell them. And they're not supposed to check with the HR person for the company you work for to say, hey, I'm in Dr. So-and-so's office. Just want to know before we do a procedure, we want to know if we're going to get paid for it. So we want to right. we want to verify that Mr. Cohen is an employee who's on a plan mm -hmm. and it covers this. They're not supposed to get into that type of stuff. Unless you want them to know. Unless you want. Same way with attorney-client privilege. An attorney cannot discuss their client's information. The client can discuss anything they want, but the attorney can't without the client's permission. Hmm. So anyway, those are the three basic documents on the health side of your house. On the financial, and again, on the healthcare proxy. If you don't have one, Life goes on, but if you don't have one and you need it, someone's gonna to have to become your guardian, mm -hmm. and that's a process in the probate court. And that's public, and it takes time, and because of that, it takes money, and that could all be obviated if you have a healthcare proxy. So people should have that. Now on the financial side of your house, you know, if someone's banged up to the point where they can't make their own health decisions, they're not going around taking care of their mortgage, making their car payment, and doing their financial things. So people are encouraged to have a power of attorney, a durable power of attorney that will not be affected by any subsequent disability. And on that document, again, that's important because it lets somebody 
conduct financial information and acts and decisions for you. But you gotta pick the right person. Sure. So that's very important. So you need the client to weigh in. You, you need the right person to do that because that can, that's a powerful document. And yeah. You gotta be careful who you pick. But that is an important document. And again, if you need it and you don't have one and you become incompetent, it's too late to get one because you're not competent in that hypothetical. So someone would have to go to probate court again hmm. and be named your conservator and petition the court that you are in the category of a protected person and you need somebody else to manage your financial affairs. Now the probate code changed a lot in Massachusetts in 2010. And this guardianship and conservatorship uh, becomes a big issue, which again, you can eliminate with those other s simple documents. Mm -hmm. Same way people should have, if they own a home, it's a no brainer that someone should have a homestead exemption. Again, simple document to execute, easy to get recorded at the registry, doesn't cost a lot of money, but you have to do it when you're able to. And those documents, are all documents that assist people, Roy, with living. And I haven't said the D word at all. You know, we're not talking about dying. Mm -hmm. But there are documents for that too. And if people pass on, um, they should have a will, which is how you asked that uh, first introduced this topic. But a will only takes effect when you die. And the reason I put it off to the end about those other documents. If you had somebody that suffered a very debilitating major stroke today, and they're, they're still alive and well, and they could be around for a long, long time, mm -hmm. a will doesn't help them with all those other situations we just talked about. Right. You know, a, a will will dictate what happens to certain probate assets after they pass. And so that gets into what's a probate asset versus not, and what, what do you do if you become disabled, and that's why trusts uh, are such a, a, a favorable instrument by estate planners to utilize trust because that allows somebody to still manage your affairs if you're not able to do that, but you're still alive and well. Mm -hmm. You know, in a, in an around town here, um, you probably, um, have seen, you know, you get around everywhere and this town, like every other town, has those four houses everyone drives by and they go, gee, look at that house. Doesn't look like anyone lives there. Grass is always high, it looks like it's vacant. It is. The owner there is in a skilled nursing facility somewhere. They never had any documents. They might have a will but the will only kicks in when they die. Mm -hmm. And so no one was left in charge to manage the asset, the house. It's vacant, may need work, those type of things, and all those type of things are like that. Do you um, run seminars? Yeah, we do on occasion. A couple times a year we have seminars and we uh, Invite but, people to come to them? But, but yeah, it's, it's usually a, uh, a small direct mail thing. We haven't done too many uh, of the public, uh, big public ones, because we try to keep it to about 50 invited guests on the thing, because we want a small enough audience to go over things and give enough detail on that. And uh, no one has to sign anything. We just give the information. Because I think if you give people the information, they'll make the right decisions Correct. for themselves. So we're, we're very, uh, we're very low key. Uh, it, it is a profession. Law is a profession. We don't. Uh, we're not trying to sell to people. We. Uh, just, matter of fact, it, it's important. sad. Yeah, it, it, it's sad when we see things that could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. But like I said, on those documents I talked about, they take less time and cost less money than what happens if you don't have those documents. Sure. 
but you can't, you can't make people do it. You know? I notice in uh, some of the information that uh, you uh, mentioned advanced directives. What, are, what is that? Yeah, advanced directives would be the umbrella term for those type of documents that you execute in advance of the need to direct what you would want to happen in advance of the exigency. So, for example, in those documents, if you, when we talk about the healthcare proxy, living will, HIPAA waiver, durable power of attorney, those type of things would be advanced directives. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, and if you have uh, particular uh, strong feelings on a particular thing, you should do those in advance when you have the competency and the capacity to do those things without any of the other pressures of a situation uh, dealing with that. And, uh, and you have to make choices, and that can be difficult for, for people too. Now I told you that there's a thing called an attorney-client privilege. Right. And I know you get that, but how it applies sometimes is more difficult. Somebody can call the lawyer to say, hi, Attorney Crimmins, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, you did some work for my mother. And, uh, you know, my mother picked my big sister to be her agent, and I'm not so sure my big sister is doing the right job. Um, I can only talk to somebody that the client authorizes me to talk to. Correct. And a family member may call, and they may have very legitimate concerns. You can't talk But to sometimes them. they don't quite understand, and an attorney cannot just uh, get on the phone with anyone and do that. And uh, there's only so much you can do on the phone anyway, because you have to know who you're talking with, mm -hmm. and you can't get into somebody's uh, things like that. So that's one point on advanced directives. And the other, the other point is, like I said, people have to understand attorneys represent clients and they don't always understand who the client is and your loyalty is to your client. So if on an estate, the person in charge of the estate is called the personal representative, if that's your client and people wanna know about certain type of things going on, we have to say, hey, I have to check in with my client. And sometimes they can get a little upset that you just can't give them an answer on something or tell them why or how, and that conversation has to include your client. I'm, I'm thinking back to one of the subjects you, uh, you brought up, and I'm, I'm concerned about it, and that's the power of attorney. Yep. Now, if somebody signs and authorizes someone to be a power, to be the power of attorney, that person then controls the person who's asked for the person to sign for them, if that makes sense. It, it, it can, it can, but the, so, do, the document that we call a durable power of attorney is a document out of uh, agency law, which basically says, you and I can give permission for certain people to act for us. Regardless of our condition? No, 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 that's where the durable part. So before, under agency law, if I gave you permission to act for me, if you were my attorney and I'm on a vacation and I'm having a real estate closing to refinance my mortgage, mm -hmm. but I, I'm away, I can't change my plans, but if I don't close by next Friday, I lose the rate. Mm -hmm. I give you my power of attorney or my authority to act for me and sign for me at that closing. In what way, shape, or form? Well, it would be a document. It would be called the limited power of attorney for that purpose. Okay. But under agency law, if I became disabled or incompetent or I died, that power of attorney would cease. Mm -hmm. those, those authorities cease. So here was the problem the legislature had to deal with. I have a power of attorney where Roy Cohen is my attorney in fact 
under a power of attorney. And I become incompetent and I'm in a skilled nursing facility. Back in the old days, it weren't that all that old, 30 years ago, just when I needed you to perform those duties, you wouldn't be able to because if I became incompetent, your authority ceased. So that's why the legislature changed the power of attorney statutes to this thing called a durable power of attorney that will not be affected in the event that I become disabled or incompetent after I sign it. It's ongoing. Right. So here is the, here's the thing, and I can have a power of attorney that goes in effect right away and give my attorney, in fact, authority right upon signing, or I can have it in the future, a springing power that only kicks in if certain things happen. Like what? Well, some, some people addressing that concern you have, which is legit, some try, sometimes try to over finesse it. They say, I want someone to be my attorney, in fact, under a power of attorney, but I'm concerned if I give it to somebody today, they can uh, just uh, do me wrong. So I want to put in the document that the only way I can, this power of attorney will kick in is if two doctors both determine that I'm incompetent and mm -hmm. if two doctors that meet under the light and the, the Eiffel Tower on a certain day say that at the same time, then I'm incompetent and then so-and-so can act. And the problem is making that work when you need it down the road. Because mm -hmm. when you approach the doctor and you say, uh, doctor, I want to talk to you about so-and-so and, well, I can't talk to you because uh, that's my patient and you're not, you know? Understand. And, and, and those type of things. So, right. But you address the key point, Roy, and, and here's the key point. You have to be careful, and lawyers go over this with people, you have to be careful who you pick and put in positions of trust. Right. Those fiduciary appointments. And all the documents in the world aren't going to stop a wrong person from doing something. Mm -hmm. There are standards in the court, there are fiduciary standards, and you can bring someone to court, but is there a possibility they could do you great economic harm? Yes, which is why lawyers will say to their clients, hey, think about it and make sure you're picking Important. the right person, right. not just the person you love, but the person you can trust. Uh, who you can trust with that, that Absolutely. does not have financial pressures or whatever in their life mm -hmm. that will sometimes tug at them to not do the th uh, thing. All the documents that we have talked about, if you're competent, you can revoke, you can amend, you can take back. Mm -hmm. The key is being competent. Gotcha. But you can change your mind and all that. It's only if you, very few documents are irrevocable, and on those documents, they can be very good in the right circumstances but irrevocable means irrevocable. That's forever, and you gotta be real careful. Absolutely, you gotta be able to trust the person. Right, right. Amazing. Well, Frank, this has been very informative. I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which way to turn first, and hopefully everybody that uh, um, has been watching has been uh, informed uh, uh, about the legal process and uh, uh, and do the right thing, I guess. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Roy. Thanks. Nice to be and here. And I know there was more. Another time. Another time, part two. And I want to take uh, this moment to uh, thank Gina, Gina Coe, for pushing the buttons and directing the show. Um, her daughter uh, uh, was here also, Bella. And thank Michael, uh, Mike Hammond, Dave Young, Jeff Pickett. Let me see, who else did I have? Oh, Leo McGowan, who is uh, off today, but we still were able to put the cameras all in effect. And uh, hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any comments, uh, you can put up Frank's uh, information. There it is right there. Francis T. Crimmins, Jr., Abo Inicio, Elder Law Solutions, LLC. 
He's located at 247 Washington Street, uh, where um, Amelia's restaurant is located, uh, and that's in Stoughton. If you need to get in touch with him, dial at 781-318-8295, or you can email Frank at fcrimmins at abenicioelderlaw.com. Did I say it right? Close. Perfect. 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 And that's it for another show. Um, we thank you very much for watching, and Hope you'll be able to tune in again next week for another interesting show. This is Roy Cohen saying thank you, and we'll see you.